Okay, our next speaker <clears throat> will be Chloe Masadaji. Uh, unfortunately, Chloe can't be with us for travel restriction reasons. Hi there, and welcome to Hackers Deserve Rights. I'm so excited to give this talk. It is very dear and true to my heart. Uh, my name is Chloe Masai, but before we dive into everything, I just want to say a couple of things, which is that this talk is completely dedicated to all the hackers out there who've ever been scared to disclose or to all the hackers who have been prosecuted for trying to do something good or to an actual job um, and to all the people who are in the fight to bring rights for hackers behind scenes and to you for attending this talk and also to the conference for having this talk presented. My name is Chloe Masai. I am a security and tech change maker. Um, I'm also a strategy growth consultant, but I would say that all my passion projects are being the co-founder of Hacking is Not a Crime. I'm also the co-founder of We Open Tech. Um, I also co-run a basically a project for getting representation at all C-level and board-level positions to be filled by those that are usually underrepresented. And this project is called the Open Tech Pledge. I also am a podcaster for ITSP Magazine. Um, the podcast that I run is called the Change Making Podcast. Um, basically, we talk about all of these different organizations and latest research within security and tech and how to get involved to bring about a change in either industry. I'm also a vice columnist for Security Boulevard. Um, every week I have a column called Ask Chloe and I answer any questions that come my way. Um, and also if there's anything you wanna learn about me, that is my website, which is standoutintech.com. Dot com, And also feel free to follow um, me on Twitter or Instagram at Chloe Mustagi. But if you also want to, I'm also on LinkedIn and I'm always down for connecting with you. So let's get into the real reason why you're here. But before I go into the head, I just want to reiterate that I am one of the co-founders of Hacking is Not a Crime, and I want to just quickly tell you what this organization is about because it is the reason why I'm doing this talk in the first place. So Hacking is Not a Crime, we're basically a grassroots movement that is working with the hacker community and outside the hacker community to bring rights for hackers, but really challenge the public perceptions of the hacker community. Um, which we will definitely dive into what that looks like because it's so important that we update the terminology and imagery that's used about the hacker community so then we can actually showcase who we really are um, so then we're not seen as much as a threat. So if we reduce that threat, then that means that we'll have a better chance of having better legislation um, that will serve and protect us. So hack is not a crime. If you want to participate, feel free to visit at hackingisnotacrime.org. Um, and also, we are on Twitter um, at hacknotcrime. Now, the thing I want to talk about in this conversation with you today is the difference between what is a hacker versus an attacker. And the reason that we use these terminology is they really separate that there's these two groups within the community. Um, so if you're a hacker, you may also go by security researcher, but basically you use your skills to keep things secure you don't extort, you stay within scope and you exploit with permission only versus an attacker. Um, the intent is very different than the hacker. They use the same skills, but the difference is that they use the skills to hurt and extort. Um, they exploit with out permission and usually there's a criminal intent. Usually this could be tied on financial or just for um, in a power play in many ways. So that's why throughout this conversation, I am not gonna use um, other terminology to describe these persons. Um, it's either hacker or attacker. And I'm mostly gonna be focusing on the hacker side um, because that is what hacking is not a crime is all about. Also what I'm passionate about which is bringing rights for those individuals that are trying to keep us safe. But there is something that you should know is that because those two groups coexist, the thing is that most of the public see us as one group. So hackers are the same as attackers and vice versa. 
And this is the problem because the current landscape really showcases that we have a problem when it comes to the public perception of who we are in the community. So we're gonna kind of talk about the current landscape very short. So you have an idea of why we're in this situation, but also how serious the situation can be. So um, I don't know if you know DJI, but they're a known drone manufacturer. Um, and there is this guy named Kevin. Um, Kevin and his friend basically came across a brand new bug bounty program that DJI put together and organized and created themselves. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that when you're creating your own bug bounty program, you need to have someone who's going to manage that program because you're going to get a plenty of people coming and contact you. You want to make sure that you have the ability to communicate within 24 hours. Um, it's really important for security measures to be able to be quick and responsive. Um, but there was a little flag here because DJI, it took about two weeks to respond to Kevin's first inquiry. So Kevin sent an email asking them what is in scope um, before participating in their bug bounty program. And it took them two weeks to respond to that email which it shouldn't be. It should just be a copy and paste of something that's already on their website internally and externally, but it took two weeks. But when he did receive it, um, he did submit a bug. Now, the thing to note about this bug, it was something that was a really good bug that he found, and he was awarded with 30K. Now, the one thing about this is that even though he was going to receive 30K for it, he needed to sign an agreement with DJI. However, this agreement didn't offer any protection for him. So that means if he were to take the 30K, DJI could go after him. And this is the fear that a lot of hackers have when it comes to disclosing, because they're worried that even if they disclose, they get paid. Um, if there's no protection for them, they're concerned what this will look like in the near future if the company will come after them somehow. Now, the thing is that once again, Kevin got, he found out what was in scope. He stayed within scope. He didn't exploit. Um, he actually found something reported. They wanted to give him 30K, um, but then the contract for him to receive that 30K offered no protection for him. So he walked away. This alerted DJI. They started worried about PR. They worried about legal issues that could happen. And they saw him as a threat. And that when they responded to him, uh, they didn't realize that their internal conversations were also within that email. So Kevin got a hold of that internal conversation, literally calling him out that he is a threat to their PR. And so... Kevin was nervous, as you could possibly imagine. Why is it? Why are they suddenly, you know, communicating and calling me as a potential problem? He received basically a lawsuit, in a sense, um, and this is what you see on the screen right now. Basically, saying that he broke the law um, because it's connected to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act claiming that he went out of scope, when in reality, he stayed within scope. Um, of course, what he did was probably the best way of doing it, but you should always talk to your attorney if you do run into a situation like this. He basically took every single conversation he's ever had DJI and publicly posted it. Of course, DJI pulled out from the lawsuit um, because it became a PR situation. So... This is the thing to keep in mind is that we have companies that don't really know how to work with hackers when they communicate about a vulnerability, but we also have cases where they totally know what we're doing, but they still want to remain in power and they know that the hacker community doesn't have any protections and they can use that for their own gain. And this is where it becomes scary. So you're probably wondering, so how do we fix this? How do we get protection for hackers? Well, through my poli sci background is that we have to influence the public cycle. And that means uh, making sure that we work with the media, organizations, and legislation. So in order to have a change in public perception of the hacker community is for the community to get involved and understand who we are, um, but also for the public to have a better idea that we are not 
hackers are not attackers. They're two very separate parties. One's protecting you from the attacker side. Um, and by media, what that is, if you are not aware, it's press and social media and marketing. Um, organizations, of course, these are companies, these can be government entities, legislation is your legislators, um, basically that can form and write laws. So let's dive into how these three play. But in order to understand how three of those things play, remember that's media, organizations, and legislation, is that you have to understand how human behavior works because we're dealing with humans. And so it's important for us to understand the cognitive behind scenes of why we are where we are. So we're going to kind of deep dive here in your brain. But first, I want you to understand this one term, which is called a socially constructed belief. Um, and basically, the it's this idea that whatever you have learned directly or indirectly is how you make sense of the world around you. So say, for example, um, that, you know, whenever you open your book, uh, if, if it has someone who is described as a hacker in the book, you're automatically going to assume that person is probably a criminal character. Or when you turn on the TV and it's a TV series and they say the term hacker, um, you usually see them with a hoodie and in a basement and doing something illegal. Um, but once again, bad character, most likely. Um, these are socially constructed beliefs. It's basically stuff that we have seen, we've heard, um, and us trying to make sense of the world in the simplest way possible by putting things into different categories. That's how we make sense of the world. So socially constructed beliefs don't mean that they are real though. So I want to reiterate this. Socially constructed beliefs are things that you need to challenge all the time because chances are it leads to biases, it leads to stereotyping, it can become a really bad problem. So let's talk about that. So socially constructed beliefs, once again, is the idea that you've picked up something from the environment about how the world works. So say, for example, that when growing up, you heard from adults and teachers saying that people with pink hair are dangerous. Um, and every time you turn on the news, you always see it's the person with the pink hair who is getting locked up or that if you're watching a movie and you see someone with pink hair in it, you know that that person is probably the bad guy. Now, the thing is, is that you've probably been told indirectly and directly that people with pink hair are dangerous. This is a hypothetical thing. People with pink hair are not dangerous. Okay. But in this scenario, imagine you've always been told this indirectly and directly that pink, people with pink hair are dangerous. So what happens is, is that when you are, say, for example, you're walking down the street. And while you're walking down the street, there's someone behind you who has pink hair. And in your brain, suddenly you have a warning going on. And this, is, this warning happens in your amygdala. It's basically in the subconscious part of your brain. Um, and the amygdala is kind of a survival mechanism um, around potential threats. It also tends to sort and program us and who's like me, who's not like me, and anything that falls into not like me means danger. Um, so this is a threat. So if you don't have pink hair and the person behind you has pink hair, you may see them as a threat. Um, also because the socially constructed belief you have from society that people with pink hair are dangerous. So once again, back in the scenario, you're walking down the street, there's someone with pink hair. Now your amygdala is sending a warning saying, warning, warning, someone with pink hair is behind you. Um, and then it sends that signal to be verified in the prefrontal cortex, which is the front part of your brain, which uses logic and reason to figure out whether or not this is a threat. Now, the amygdala is completely subconscious, so you don't really know that you are seeing someone as a threat. However, when it comes to the prefrontal cortex, when that message is sent on whether or not to act on that threat, that now is a conscious decision that you're making. So when you come into the conscious part of your brain in the prefrontal cortex, you're then breaking it down the scenario. So the person from big, with pink hair is behind you. And so you have an option, which is to go across the street, 
to clutch your bag a little bit closer or to go into a store or to ignore. So you have these four different ideas and you break it down in your prefrontal cortex of figuring out what is the best way forward to protect yourself using the information that you have. Now, the thing to note is that this is that moment where you can challenge a socially constructed belief. So that socially constructed belief that someone with pink hair is someone dangerous is no, it's something that you can actually question. Is that real? Is that really true? I mean, don't they just have pink hair? There's nothing different between me and that person in any sort of way, except that they have pink hair. So why are they more dangerous? And that might come through your mind, but most of the time it doesn't. When we challenge things that we have been programmed to believe, sometimes we have to see it in person. And what that means is that research has shown the best way how to conquer these socially constructed beliefs is by having a face-to-face -face conversation. So say like how I'm doing right now with you. Now imagine if someone uh, posted a YouTube video and that person had pink hair and sharing how it's hard for them to have pink hair because everyone around them sees them as a threat. They see them as a criminal just because the way that they look and because they have pink hair and that it scares them in many ways because they just have pink hair and they just wish society could see them with pink hair and that they weren't always depicted in movies and in books that people with pink hair are always the bad guy. Say that you came across that video. And so when you're in that situation where there is someone with pink hair behind you and you're trying to decide whether or not to cross the street, clutch your bag a little bit tighter, go into the store or ignore the threat, you also remember this video that you watched on YouTube and how this person with pink hair described how hard it is to have pink hair because everyone sees you as a threat. Now you have that ability to question that conscious belief. And that's when you make the decision. Should I ignore this threat? And that's the point I want to get to with you is understanding that socially constructed beliefs aren't always true. Um, and if in many ways, it can also hold us back as society because we're putting things into boxes that don't belong to be there in the first place because it's just easier for us to digest. But the thing is, is that we have to go outside our comfort zone. We have to look for answers to be able to understand whether or not what we have been led to believe is true or not. And this is the thing we always have to understand always have the ability to question your biases. It's okay to be uncomfortable. And yet none of us like to see anything bad about who we are, but the reality, that's the only way that we learn is getting outside of our comfort zone and trying to learn and hear other people's perspectives and stories. And the reason I wanted to talk about this with you is human behavior really does matter. And these socially constructed beliefs of the hacker community is extremely strong. Um, and it has been very challenging to change things so then we can have rights. So that's why I want to talk to you today about socially constructive beliefs so then we can go into further depth of why we are where we are. There's another thing that you can do. Remember I mentioned about if you wanna challenge stereotypes and socially constructive beliefs, you can participate. We have this incredible project with Hacking is Not a Crime where we have our advocates basically take uh, videos of themselves um, talking about why they became a hacker, the things that they love about it, and also what are the issues that they face by going down this route. So you can participate too if you like. Now, we now know about how human behavior works to a certain extent of how things are, how they are. Um, so now we're gonna talk about how to influence the public perception of hackers. First things first, as we know, as socially constructed beliefs stem from the media, that means in your movies and your, the news, that means on social media, that means in photos, that means terminology and it, this is the reason why people are still scared of us is because even if I search 
ethical hacker and criminal hacker or attacker. I get the exact same imagery. It doesn't even matter. It's always this person with a hoodie in a basement and it's dark or they have a ski mask. And that's the thing we have to understand is that through imagery and also the terminology that is used by using the term um, hacker instead of attacker, it has kept feeding into the socially constructed belief that hackers are dangerous individuals that are out to harm. And this is the thing we have to understand is that it hurts when the media doesn't know the difference between a hacker and attacker, because we get these type of things where, um, you know, a hacker is starting to leak patients therapy notes. Let's be honest, that's not a hacker. A hacker would never want that because they're all about protecting those notes from getting out there in the public or hackers can turn your home computer into a bomb. Once again, that is an attacker. At the end of the day, all these headlines always use the term hackers when they should be using the term attackers. So in other words, we kind of have to change that. So the best way how to do that is to contact them directly and correct them nicely. And this is the reason why, because the one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of journalists, they don't know better. They don't know that these two groups, you know, are, they exist, but separately. And so we have to let them know. And once we do let them know, they will report the truth if they're a great journalist. Journalists are all about reporting the facts. So journalists that are willing to work hard to get the facts right are the ones that we have an ability to work with. So once again, how you can do this situation, if you're reading content on social media or in the news is to contact them. You can DM them or you can comment publicly, but remember to be kind because they don't know better. So you want to use empathy in a sense, be like, hey, I like what you wrote here, but I want to let you know that basically when you said the term hackers, I think you meant att like attackers, not hackers, because we're two very different parties. We're actually the party that's trying to protect you um, from attackers. So here's some examples. You could, you could kindly call it out on Twitter. Also, we see this quite a bit in um, when it comes to companies, when they're marketing their products, they'll use the terms hackers when they mean attackers. So we also wanna kindly call it out. Uh, remember, be kind. Um, and, or you can always DM them as well. Just letting them know, hey, just want, you're kind of hurting our community because this is inaccurate. You really mean this. Because once again, not just journalists don't know what terminology to use, but also marketing folks in security don't know the right terms to use. And because of that, we have to correct them. And once again, once we correct them, um, usually they will make sure that it's changed. Um, but also is it great to give them kudos when they get it right? Be like, yeah, thank you for using the right terminology. I really appreciate it. They love that. Another thing you can do is send a letter to the copy desk. Um, for say for the, this is an example that we sent to the New York Times. Um, you can always let them know that, hey, this is something that you should keep in mind that, you know, the terminology they're using is inaccurate because of these and these facts. And because of this, we have all these other problems. So we would really appreciate it if you can make sure that all future articles around the hacker community or attackers uses the right terminology. It's always great to do that. Remember, be kind once again, because they don't know better. And you can always comment. Um, so say, for example, if ever you're giving a comment to the news about the hackers or attackers or anything related to security, always remind the reporter that there's a difference between the hacker and an attacker and to please use the correct terminology when they um, publish the article, but also state it in your comments itself, uh, reminding them that you're talking about attackers, not hackers. Um, this is what I tend to do every time I talk to the press. So then uh, the person who's writing the article or if it's you know, on, on live, on TV, is for people to be acknowledging that there's a difference between the two groups. 
And if you are ever doing anything in public about the hacker community, please don't wear a hoodie when on camera. You can wear a suit, you can wear a dress, you can do whatever you want. But the thing is, we're trying to challenge um, these uh, socially constructed beliefs that hackers wear hoodies and dark basements. So it's always good and encouraging to change it up so people see that you don't always wear a hoodie and you don't work in a basement. It might be a good thing to do because we're trying to challenge what they believe what we look like. Because the result of the media, if we don't do any of these things, is that we've had a huge impact. Um, that 94% of the Forbes Global 2000 still don't have a vulnerability disclosure policy. Um, one out of four hackers do not report vulnerabilities. Uh, we still have laws that prevent good hacking, such as the CFAA and the DMCA in the US. We're still seeing hackers being prosecuted on a global scale. And this is also increasing the number of bad actors because the reality is that if we don't provide protection or a pathway, um, it leaves people that are attackers to never be able to convert into becoming hackers. So this is one of the things we have to keep in mind is that when we don't have protections, this, uh, this will push people to go in a different route that we don't want them to go down. So we've talked about human behavior. We've talked about how the press plays a huge role. Um, we've also talked about how public perception is needed to change. So now let's talk about how we influence legislation. Because the thing is, is that laws prevent good hacking in the same way they prevent attackers. And we need good hacking to keep our country safe um, and also to help companies keep their customers safe and so on. So I wanted to quickly touch on the CFAA because the thing is, is that the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, it was passed in 1984, um, but it was the turning point for other countries to follow. So the US set the scene for anti-hacking law. Um, so the CFAA is, has been used in other countries um, to, for their own legislation to adapt what we have. So the one thing I want to keep you in mind is that the CFA, I absolutely hate it, and you should too. Um, and the reason for that is that um, the way that it's written, it's so vague that it could be used to prosecute others. There's also this misuse of prosecution um, as well with it um, that we have seen in the past. Um, but also there's these redundancies, basically, that you can be charged with the same uh, crime repeatedly. Um, so there's a lot of issues with the CFAA. It is really important that it comes up to date. I mean, this was written once again before Y2K, um, before the internet as we know it. Um, but also the thing to keep in mind is that when this was created, there was no representation of the hacker community or security uh, community that we know of today. Um, and in reality, when we don't have representation, in the room when laws are being discussed, that tends to hurt us quite a bit. And so this is one of the things is that the CFA needs to recognize that it is definitely way out of date and people need to be represented from our community in that conversation for when they do change things because the CFA is so old and it was an act on complete fear. Um, such as Ronald Reagan, he basically watched the war games and freaked out and was like, we need to do something about these bad people. And that's how the CFA was created for war games. You know, I love that movie in many ways. It just one of those things that is really sad that a movie um, made this law um, or inspired this law to be created. And that's why we don't have any protections. If anything, this has definitely been used against the hacker community far more than ever before. Now, the one thing to keep in mind in the US is that um, the CFA hasn't really been used against um, the hacker community for quite some time and federally, um, but we have seen it used in local government, um, such as state and, and county um, and city as well. But the other thing to keep in mind is that this is usually used by companies coming after um, basically the hacker community members. All right. Now, the other thing I want to reiterate about how much I hate the CFA is because it always 
reminds me of this one particular case. Um, in about 2011, Carmen Ortez was the U.S. Attorney's Office, basically. They charged Schwartz, Aaron Schwartz. If you don't know of him, you should, you should learn about him. Um, but basically, he hacked into the MIT computer network to download millions of scholarly articles from JSTOR. Um, it was kind of like an act meant to be civil disobedience in a way of protesting of taxpayer funded research. Um, so then taxpayers could have access to the research. And for this, the U.S. attorney brought charges that carried a maximum penalty of about 35 years in prison and $1 million in fines. Now, I just want to pause right there that in the U.S., the, the penalty for second degree murder is 25 years. This is giving him 35 years for something that never physically hurted another individual in any sort of way, um, which is just, it drives me up the wall and also charging him about $1 million in, in, in fines. Um, and the reason they were able to charge as many years and the cost and everything was because the CFA is written so vaguely. Um, and it's just, it's one of those things where it just became such a burden in so many ways for Aaron and overall, because he was dealing with a 17 month long battle with no end in sight. And unfortunately he died by suicide at the age of 26 years old in his apartment. And still to this day, um, his family has shared that he would have not done this if it wasn't for the charges that the federal prosecutors were trying to do. And it's one of those things that is, we have to remind ourselves that we don't want any more cases like this. And it, it's the reason that dr should drive all of us to wanting to change things how they are. Because the reality is that if we have improvements to legislation, that means that maybe all the Forbes Global 2000s will have a vulnerability disclosure policies and 100% of hackers can report vulnerabilities that will keep us completely safe from attackers and that we would have laws that encourage good hacking versus um, illegal hacking. And by illegal hacking, I mean hacking where you're extorting um, or you're exploiting without permission, but also it'd be less prosecution of hackers um, we'd also see a decreased number of malicious actors because they feel protected and safe and wanted um, where they feel belonging and they will be able to participate. So what can you do right now? There are some things that you can do, which is be bold and be kind, um, but most importantly, vote. If you have a problem with the situation, you should go vote. It's also about knowing who your local representatives are, because lots of the time we don't know who represents us. So it's important to know who they are and start having conversations with them by contacting them, getting a meeting. And if you need some help at all, feel free to reach out at hackingisnotacrime.org. Um, we are here to help um, when you have those conversations. Now, the last step on getting rights for hackers is, is we also need to talk about how to collab with organizations. And what I mean by that is making sure that they all have vulnerability disclosure policies. There is not a single excuse out there for a company to not have vulnerability disclosure policies. I mean it. The fact that is that we are in 2021 and vulnerability disclosure policies are there for a reason. It lets us know what's okay, what's not okay. This avoids PR situations in the future, but also it lets us know the guidelines of what to expect, where the expectations are. But then you also have the other thing, which is vulnerability disclosure policies allow hackers to report and know who to contact to report the vulnerability so then they can find it and report to you before an attacker finds it and takes advantage of it. Vulnerability disclosure policies are such a critical strategy move for your security at your organization. If you don't have it, you are not doing a good job at security. Every single company does not have an excuse for this anymore. 
because vulnerability disclosure policies, they do reduce breaches. It does allow a diverse background of people all over to find the bugs that your security team misses. It also allows bilateral trust between organizations and hackers to keep security in check. And let's be real, if you're relying on scanners, it's never going to work. You cannot rely on scanners to know what to patch and what is more critical to patch. You need to have the hackers help you out because they know the things before they get published always. So that's why we need to work with hackers. So how can you prove it? Well, the thing is, is if you do have vulnerability disclosure policies or if you don't, here are some few things to keep in mind when you create it. State what's in scope and what's out of scope. This helps us in many ways. Remember to write it not for attorneys, but for English learners, because we are all over the world and not all of us speak English fluently. So make it as basic as possible so that we have an understanding where we're all on the same page together. Contact information. If you don't give us contact information, it's really hard for us because what happens is, is that we'll reach out to you on social media in a DM or on, on Facebook sometimes or LinkedIn to try to get a hold of someone to tell them about a vulnerability because we don't have your contact information. And then it gets ignored or the marketing team does take that and they send it to a PR or legal, legal team. And then what ends up happening is that they threaten you with a lawsuit. So the thing is, it's really important is to make sure that you have contact information, but also that your marketing team, so anyone who oversees uh, sales um, or marketing on social media, for them to know if someone contacts them about a vulnerability that they know who to take it to. And so taking it to uh, the legal team, take it to the security team. It's really important that we all do that. The other thing is making sure that you have updated communication with the hacker that provided you the vulnerability information um, and always have a dedicated person to manage, prioritize, and task the basically what comes in the pipeline. If you cannot have that, I highly recommend looking at platforms that can provide a VDP. Um, and this can be Buck, Crowd, Synac, HackerOne. There's plenty of them out there, but it's really important is to have something there. Now, if you need some other help here, always go to disclose.io. They have basically um, an outline of how your vulnerability disclosure policy should look like, um, along with some languages as well. Um, it's also important to share that they have a listing that is basically crowdsourced um, that basically showcases any organization on there, um, along with our contact information and what to expect if you're participating in the vulnerability disclosure policies. Um, so it's a great site to get going on. Now, besides disclosure, the other thing to keep in mind when you want to help out on the organization front is to volunteer and give your time. Uh, feel free to reach out to EFF. I'm the Calvary uh, Cert CC, CTI League, Disclose.io, Hacking is Not a Crime. It's so important that we, we volunteer and give because there's no way we're ever going to make a change unless we come together and we dedicate some time and energy together on these fronts. So the summary of this entire talk is that start getting involved in hacker rights because this is the time we need to do it. It's now 2021. We need to see some changes. We need some protections. Um, so feel free to start by visiting hackingisnotacrime.org. Uh, feel free to reach out to become an advocate uh, with HINAC. Um, HINAC is short for Hacking is Not a Crime. Um, also volunteer and support orgs that are working to help our community. Feel free to record a video and participate in our hacker storage project. If you want more information about that, that is on our website at hackingisnotacrime.org. Um, also, when you see in the press something wrong, call it out, contact them, keep them informed. And last but not least, remember everything that you do, have empathy and be kind because we can never go anywhere unless we do that. And last but not least, in case you need someone to reiterate this, is that change starts with you and me. We have the ability to change something and that's talking about it. It's getting people involved. And we all have that ability to do that. So change can occur.
but it first starts with you taking the step forward as well. I want to just say thank you so much for existing. Thank you for having me. If you have any questions at all, feel free to reach out and feel free to follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Chloe Mustagi. And thank you once again. It's been such a pleasure to give this talk. I'm very close to, to my heart. Thank you.